Great. Well, I'm really excited tonight to um, start off our kickoff for year two. Um, it's really great to see a lot of your faces again. Um, I feel like I'm starting to get to know a lot of um, a lot of you. A lot of you. Um, we wanted to start off tonight by having um, all of the the regional coordinators and steering committee members introduce themselves really briefly. Um, so we'll go around and, and do that first. And it's really great to see um, all of you guys posting where, where you live and, and also what birds you've been seeing. So, um, so thanks for that. I think that's really fun. And just seeing like the timing of things, like some people still have some of the winter finches while other people are, are already getting lots of nice migrants showing up and some warblers even coming in from the south. So. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, so uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm Julie Hart. I am the project coordinator for the Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, and I will be sharing um, the presentation duties tonight. Um, it'll be shared by me and also Ian Davies. So Ian, if you wanna uh, introduce yourself real quick. Sure, hey everybody. Um, thanks for, for making the time to, to join this evening. Uh, like Julie said, it's great to see a bunch of Bunch of faces and names that uh, that are well known from around New York. So um, yeah, excited to chat a bit about Atlas stuff tonight and hear your thoughts and see what we can do together. Um, so in the the role of the Atlas, I'm uh, the chair of the outreach committee and a member of the steering committee. And then uh, in New York, I also um, work at the Lab of Ornithology as the eBird project coordinator, um, based out of Ithaca. Um, yeah, I, I want to now um, uh, go around to the regional coordinators and I'll just address one question that someone um, asked me in the chat and that is, we are recording this. Um, so um, people that aren't able to attend or yourself, if you wanted to, if you miss something and want to watch it later, um, you can always go back and, and see the recording later. I'll be posting that on our YouTube channel. Um, so yeah, so I did mute everyone. If you guys want, if um, maybe Anne, you wanna kick us off and introduce yourself and um, maybe say which region you are representing. Yeah, sure. Hey everybody, I'm Anne Swain. Um, I'm one of two regional coordinators for the Hudson uh, River region, uh, along with Wendy, uh, who will introduce herself later. Uh, I'm also uh, executive director of Sawmill River Audubon one of five Audubon chapters in Westchester. So I'm excited to see everybody here tonight and uh, get geared up for year two. Great. Um, Gail? Oh, Gail, you're muted here. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. I'm Gail Verhaeg. I'm one of the three regional coordinators from Western New York. Um, I'm covering Chautauqua, Cattaraugus, and Allegheny counties. Great. Um, Andrea? Hi, everybody. I'm Andrea Patterson. I'm also one of the three Western region coordinators, although I sort of uh, straddle the central region as well, so covering Rochester, New York. Um, and the surrounding area. If you're familiar with NYSOA Kingbird regions, think region two. Uh, and I'm the director of the Braddock Bay Bird Observatory here in Rochester. And Andrea is working behind the scenes tonight and helping us with the breakout sessions and um, just trying to answer questions too as, as they come up. Uh, who's next, Zach? Hi, I'm Zach Schwartz-Weinstein. I am uh, the regional coordinator for um, most of Kingbird Region 8, um, which is the capital region. Uh, so Albany, Schenectady, Saratoga, Spahari, uh, Montgomery, Fulton, uh, Rensselaer, Green, Washington, and Warren counties. Not Columbia. <laughs> Great. And um, Matt? Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Matt Medler. Um, I work at the Cornell Lab for Ornithology during the daytime at the Macaulay Library. And then at night, I serve as one of the three uh, co-coordinators for the Northern region. Um, 
which is a very large region. Uh, I'm focused primarily on the Champlain Valley and transition. So uh, Essex County and Clinton County, but I'll help out uh, in other counties as well. And, and I'm based here in Ithaca. So um, have an attachment to the central region as well. Great, thank you, Matt. Uh, Wendy? Hi, I'm Wendy Tachi. I'm uh, in Kingston, New York in Elster County. I am a co-regional coordinator of the Hudson Valley along with Ann Swain. Um, and we cover Columbia and Dutchess and Ulster and Orange and Sullivan. Um, yep. Westchester and Rockland. In Westchester and Rockland, yes. I was waiting for you to, to chime in. I'm in there, Ann. Okay. All right, I'm just scrolling through. Let's see, Molly, are you there, Molly? Yep. Hi, everybody. I'm Molly Adams. Um, I am one of three regional coordinators for New York City and Long Island, but I primarily focus on the city. Um, I'm in Queens, and I'm also the advocacy and outreach manager for New York City Audubon and the president of the Feminist Bird Club. Thanks, Molly. And I know Brendan, I saw him around too. Are you there, Brendan? All right, I'll switch to Sue. Hi, I'm Sue Barth. I'm located in Erie County and I'm one of the three Western regional coordinators. And they take care of mostly Erie County, Niagara, and Wyoming, and bits and pieces of a couple others. Seeing who else am I missing? Is it Jeff or Tom? Tom Wheeler, you're on there. Um, Tom Wheeler. I'm from uh, Canton in the northern section, and uh, I'm primarily responsible for Franklin, Hamilton, and Herkimer uh, in the Adirondacks, primarily. Um, <clears throat> and I didn't put where I saw and when I saw the when we were doing the chat. And uh, it was a late northern strike uh, over the weekend and two owls yesterday and today, so. Nice, that's great. Yeah, you're still up in North Country. <laughs> the rest of us are getting warblers. <laughs> All right, let me know if, did I miss any other regional coordinators that are on? Otherwise I'll go to the um, steering committee members that we have with us. All right, um, Greg, you're up next. Hey, I'm Greg Lawrence. I'm a research scientist at SUNY Brockport near Rochester and the current VP of NYSOA. Um, I'm on the steering committee and chair the methods committee as well. Great to see over 100 people here. And Matt Schlesinger. Hi everyone, I'm Matt Schlesinger. I'm uh, the Chief Zoologist with the New York Natural Heritage Program, uh, Julie's program as well, and uh, based here in Albany. I'm from Manhattan originally, but um, uh, a birder and, um, and bird researcher for a long time, although I dabble in a lot of different things. So spread too thin as Julie can attest to. Really grateful to have all your help and to see all of you. Did I say that I'm co-chair of the steering committee? I don't think I said that part. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, who will be next, I think, and I are co-chairing the steering committee, um, and uh, and we're very grateful for all your help and really glad to be here tonight. Thanks. Thanks, Matt and Kathy. I'm Kathy Schneider. I co-chair the steering committee along with Matt Schlesinger. Um, I live in Stuyvesant Falls, New York, and I guess I'm officially retired, though sometimes it doesn't feel that way. And as uh, co-chair of the steering committee, I think my job is primarily herding cats. And Matt and I do that together. <laughs> Great, thank you guys. Is there anyone else? Did anyone else come on? Oh, I think I just saw Mike, Mike Scheibel.
Mike, are you there? Well, I see, I know he's here. He's um, Mike Scheibel's regional coordinator down on uh, Long Island. Um, and I know Brendan Fogarty will be coming as well. And he is also down on Long Island. Um, I think that covers most everybody. Um, unless I missed anyone, last call. Sorry, Julie, I think I was muted there. There you are, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, well, I, we wanted to make sure that we took a moment to go through and introduce ourselves because we are the ones that um, will be um, with you in the breakout rooms later tonight. Um, and we want to make sure that that you guys have some faces to names and um, and uh, yeah, get get to know us a little bit better. Um, so with that, I think I will start. Um, I will start us off with our presentation. All right, let me just make sure you guys can see the presentation. Yes. Yes, great, thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, Ian and I are going to go through and give, give a brief um, introduction and overview um, in presentation format. And, and while we do that, if you have questions um, about what we're talking about, then please put those in the chat uh, and then we will address those before we uh, move on to the, the breakout sessions. But we are trying to, to keep this short so that we have more time um, to discuss and, and answer questions from people. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll kick us off and welcome to year two of the Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, let's see not. There we go. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit tonight about year one, um, what we found, some of the highlights from the first year, from 2020. Um, and then we're going to really focus on um, opportunities and where, where you guys can fit in and, and where, um, you know, where we need to focus this coming year. And then, as I mentioned, we'll have the breakout sessions and for probably about half an hour, and then we will come back into a larger group and then we can um, and address any of the questions that, um, that, you weren't, we're, that were not addressed in the, the smaller groups, or um, if there are no big questions like that, then we can also, um, you know, share stories and, and things like that. So. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to hearing uh, what you guys discuss in the breakout sessions. So you just met um, a lot of us. This is the, the core part of the, the people that are coordinating this project. We are the people that uh, you will most likely be interacting with. Um, so we have broken the state up into six different regions. Uh, and then we have multiple regional coordinators for each region, um, and except for capital region, that's just Zach. Um, but I live here in capital region, so uh, so I help him out some too. Um, and so we do have you know separate email addresses for each of these team members, and um, and that and that's like a really easy way for you to get a hold of us. Plus, we're almost all almost all of us are also on. Um, on social media too, so you can reach us that way as well. Um, so we are the ones that are kind of spearheading the, the outreach and, and also, um, you know, taking a look at, at the data that, you, that comes in. Um, and then I'm interfacing with the, the steering committee and all of the subcommittees as well. Um, so this is a really big project and um, there's a lot of us that are involved in it, including all of you who are providing invaluable data. So I wanted to start with just a brief overview of what we did find um, in year one. We had a tremendously successful first year, I, in my opinion. Um, so we have now over 1,800 people that have submitted data to the project. Um, so this is 
a snapshot of um, what you can see on the actual Atlas website. Um, this is something that's updated continuously in real time. Um, and this is for the entire state so far for the project. So you can also see that we've had over 166,000 checklists submitted, which is remarkable. Um, and then um, in terms of the amount of data that's come in, we've had over 600,000 reading observations were entered just um, in 2020. So that's not including what people have already entered this year so far. So this is um, the statewide snapshot. And it is important to note for those of you that haven't been, um, been participating in the Atlas already that we break the state up into these um, 5,710 little smaller blocks um, to make this a much more um, tangible project, project so that people can go to each of those blocks and survey. And then we've further broken that down into um, a, a subset of priority blocks. So we take a third of the, all the blocks and we call those priority blocks. And those are where we do want people to focus so that we have a nice um, spread across the entire state. So we get a good sampling of everything across the state. Um, so, so what that means is that we have 1,815 priority blocks. So if we look at the number of blocks that have data, um, over 77% of all blocks have been, have had someone go and visit them, which is remarkable. And that amounts to 82% of the priority blocks. Um, so to me, that's, that's really impressive that we've been able to, to reach that many blocks already. Another really impressive stat is that we have been able to add breeding codes for over 280 species. Um, so not all of those are species that breed in the state, um, but all of them um, were um, undergoing at least part of their breeding cycle within the state. So um, they might have been singing or courting um, and then moving further north. Um, but all of them did exhibit some sort of breeding behavior in the state. And then um, for those breeding codes, you know, we have, for those of you that, that aren't aware, you know, we have different categories of breeding, so different levels of support. So we have the possible breeders and then the probable breeder, breeders that we have a little bit more evidence that they're actually breeding locally. And then we have the confirmed breeders. Um, and those are the ones that we have really strong evidence that we suspect are breeding locally. Um, and so for the number of species that we have confirmed breeding locally in the state, um, we have 213 species. Uh, the last atlas, uh, there were about 245 species. So we do have a few that we're missing, um, but we are really far on our way already with just um, the one year of data. And of course, all of this, um, these data would not be possible without all of those 1800 Alicers in the state. Um, and everyone has been participating in different ways to different amounts, however it fits in their schedule. Um, and, but every single checklist that you submit is, is really valuable in contributing to this overall project. Um, and I will say that, you know, this, project. This is the, the third time that the state of New York has been doing a, is doing a breeding bird atlas. Um, and by having these three different data points, we're really going to be able to track well what um, kinds of changes there are in populations and in distributions of, of these species in the state. Um, so it's a really invaluable tool for conservation for us. So here we can visualize a little bit more of where people went. Um, and these are also maps that you can get on the, on the website. Uh, if someone could put in the chat um, the, the effort um, link, that would be great. Um, and uh, so these are different uh, ways of filtering the data. Um, in the top left, you have just 
all of the places where people have added codes, breeding codes, they've observed breeding behaviors for different species. And this is where you can see that we've really covered that 75 to 80% of blocks in the state, right? You can see that we've got a little bit of coverage across a lot of, a lot of area. But then if you look at the, the chart on the right, the map on the right, you'll see that's the number of species that have been confirmed breeding in each block. Um, and there you can see that there's a lot of blocks that have um, hardly any species have been, have been uh, confirmed in them. So that means that even though a lot of these blocks have been visited, there's still a lot of work to be done in a lot of these blocks. Um, some other ways to look at the data um, I'm showing on the bottom here, and you can see um, the number of daytime hours, which obviously um, is really concentrated around urban areas. And then you also have the, the nocturnal hours, and you can see there that um, we're pretty much uh, lacking a lot of coverage in that air area. Um, that's something that we're focusing on a lot this year. Um, and then with looking at all four of these maps together side by side, you can kind of see that there are you know, consistent gaps in, in certain parts of the state where uh, we honestly, we expected these areas to be under-surveyed, um, particularly last year with the pandemic and, and people staying closer to home. Um, so, you know, we can see, you know, the Adirondacks, obviously there's a lot of work to be done. There's not many birders there. Um, and a lot of people didn't travel last year. Um, you also have that northern part of the St. Lawrence Valley along the northern border. Also the Alleghenies and the Catskills, you know, these are all areas where, where we expected there to be um, a little bit of a gap. So, so we, we did an amazing amount of work this year and I think there's still, you know, the obvious places are, are where we need to focus this year. Okay, so I wanted to share um, a couple of things that I thought were really, really interesting when I've been going through and, and reviewing the data from year one. Um, so I've been looking at some of the, the species data. Um, the first thing I wanted to share was the most common species, the most frequently reported species. Um, and these are, you know, all the, the backyard birds that we think of, you know, the robins, the starlings, the Canada geese. Um, and these are, are really the species that, pardon me, um, those are the species that are pretty ubiquitous across the entire state. So most blocks in the state will probably have these species in them. Um, and they're also, if you're a beginner atlas or um, they're a really good place to start out, you know, so if you're just gonna, if you're starting out on a new block or you're starting out with birding or with atlasing, um, these are some really easy, easy species to, to start with. Um, a lot of them have really obvious behaviors um, that, that are, are easy to observe. All right, then there's a few species where we can already say with one year of data that these species have expanded their range in New York State um, since the first atlas, since the first breeding bird atlas. Um, and I can say that, you know, looking at the numbers, you know, proportionally or in absolute numbers and looking at it as a percent of blocks or total number of blocks, um, no matter how you cut it, these species have expanded their, their distribution in the state um, with just one year of data. And I'm sure that we'll find uh, you know, additional blocks for a lot of these species. Um, so these little numbers are the, so if we look at bald eagle, the two is the number of blocks where bald eagles were confirmed breeding in the 1980 atlas. So that's from 1980 to 1985. There were two blocks with bald eagles. Now we have over 260 blocks. Um, and every day I'm hearing people telling me stories. Oh my God, I just heard about a new bald eagle nest that I didn't know about right down the road for me. So um, I'm sure we'll add a few more there. 
Uh, monk parakeet, that's another species that's, um, that's a species that's moved into a lot of urban areas across the country. It's not, it's not native, um, but it, it does seem to do really well in cities. Um, so there's quite a few uh, populations of them. They make these huge um, colonial nests um, that are pretty obvious. Uh, there's a lot of them down in New York City and Long Island. Forster's turn have also increased. Sandhill crane, um, I just think that's wonderful. I love sandhill cranes and um, they are starting to, to spread across the state. Trumpeter swans as well, um, Caspian terns and ring-billed gulls. So all of these species have been um, increasing across the state for various reasons. So just to show you, I'm gonna zoom in on a couple of species real quick here. So we have, this is for bald eagle. Um, so in the top left, you have the map for where bald eagles were distributed in the 1980 atlas. The lower left is where they were in the 2000 atlas. And then on the right, obviously you have what we've seen, um, what we've documented already for the 2000. Uh, 2020 atlas. So it's really like they've just spread and taken over the entire state, which I find remarkable. Similar story here, we have osprey. Um, and again, this, you know, this is another species that's also been recovering since the DDT was banned. Um, and you can see them uh, just really um, having denser population pockets across the state and kind of spreading out. All right, and then this is Merlin. So I don't have a map for the 1980 Atlas. They were not breeding in the state at that time. They weren't found breeding in the state until the 1990s. Um, by 2000, they had moved down a bit from, from the north, from Canada, um, and now they have already reached all the way down into um, like New York City. You can see some probable um, observations down there, um, and they're all the way out in, in the far, far western part of the state. Um, so this is a, a really interesting um, expansion that, where, that has moved from the north to the south. And then in contrast, um, here's black vulture, which is a species that um, also was not in the state in the 1980s, um, slowly moved up from the south into the lower Hudson Valley in the 2000s. And then by last year, we have them documented all the way up, um, up into Lake Champlain Valley and, and even all the way out towards Buffalo. So um, this is another uh, species that has expanded quite a bit. All right, so with that, that was our, our year one summary. And, and now um, Ian is going to talk about looking forward into year two. Great, wonderful. Um, yeah, thank, thanks so much, Julie, for that, that uh, kind of wrap up of, of year one. And yeah, I mean, it's just super exciting to see kind of what we've been able to achieve together as a a community of atlasers in uh, in the first year of this this five year project, and so now as as April dawns and warblers and other fun things are on their way back north, uh, what what can we do this year? Um, what are the what are the opportunities and and what are some of the the fun things that we can find uh, in our state uh, for breeding birds uh, this this upcoming breeding season? Um, one of the things just to, to reiterate is that one of the thing, uh, kind of the most key elements of atlasing are um, the three atlas essentials. And so um, we felt it'd be worth just reiterating as we're heading into the new season, kind of these, these three essential components of contributing to the New York Breeding Bird Atlas. And so the first one of those is um, birding within blocks in within an atlas block, making sure that when you're out birding uh, in a day that all of your observations on any given bird checklist are staying within a single atlas block. 
and having that be such a key element of making sure that these data are uh, valuable for the project. So the first essential, basically um, follow blocks, stay, stay within blocks. The second one being to just go out and observe breeding behaviors. And uh, I'm, I'm sure if uh, any of, if you've had as much fun as I have with this so far, it's just such a, a fun new kind of lens through which to look at birds, to, to go out and kind of think deeply about what they're doing at that moment on that day and um, what that kind of means in the context of their breeding cycle and, and their life cycle. And so um, when you're out following the block boundaries, making sure that you're also then reporting any breeding behaviors that you observe, uh, whether that is a, a singing bird or, or any of the others. Um, if someone wants to drop the link to um, the Atlas Essentials in the chat during this, that would, that would be great too. Um, and so there's of course help content for all of this. So if you saw a black tern like this sitting on a nest, which would be really cool, I've never, never seen one this close, um, that would then be an ON uh, occupied nest code that would confirm that species within that block. And then the, the last ingredient of the, the three ingredient meal here is um, dropping uh, and making sure that you're entering your checklists in the New York Breeding Bird Atlas portal. And so this is kind of a dedicated um, interface where you can kind of say, when I was out birding, I was following these block boundaries and reporting the breeding birds that I had. And if so, then this is a great fit for the Atlas. And that, that combination is just a really powerful way um, to make your sightings count. And so in, in this year, kind of how, how can these sightings meet, be most valuable? What, what, new, what new adventures the, does Atlasing offer and what opportunities do each one of us have to kind of contribute to this project that will help inform conservation and, and other work throughout uh, New York uh, for, for years and, and decades to come, hopefully. Um, one of the, the big pieces is just, I think for the next four years, really, um, a lot of it's around kind of filling, filling the gaps. Like, like Julie talked about before, there, a lot of us live in more urbanized areas or population centers, and those are easier to kind of cover in terms of going out there and seeing what birds are there. Um, but in some of these regions, there's, there's more effort needed to get there up into the Alleghenies or the remote Adirondacks. And those are where um, there can be a lot of excitement. So if you have opportunity and live near a region that, or near an opportunity that we'll talk about here, this is how you can help most in year two. And at least for me, these are often some of the most fun ways to, to kind of engage with birds again in, in a new way. Um, so it is worth noting, of course, that every single sighting you contribute has value and is, and is really useful to help us together understand birds in New York. But these are some creative ways to, to really think about some of the most valuable pieces. Um, one of those is that when, when many of us are out atlasing, I know for me at least, I think of atlasing as kind of May, maybe late May through July and, and August is kind of the peak season. That's when there's the most things breeding and the, the most birds that are out and about. Um, but for many resident species, some of them are actually exhibiting the most breeding behavior and are easiest to detect in the early season. Um, so examples might be woodpeckers or many raptors that are building nests. And so um, each one of these kind of uh, opportunities we'll talk about here will be in the context of completing a block. So the goal, like Julie said earlier, is over this five-year project to complete every one of the uh, 1,815 priority blocks. And so within each of those, there's a set of criteria um, if someone could drop the, the block completion guidelines in the chat um, that are kind of within any one of these blocks, what um, we're hoping to collectively uh, understand about the birds there. In the context of early season breeders, each block should have um, at least three visits throughout the breeding season with one in the early season to make sure that many of these uh, early species are, are being detected and found. Um, so if you haven't visited uh, one of your favorite blocks this year, now's a great time to go out as woodpeckers are drumming all over the place. Um, many of the resident raptors might be carrying sticks and building a nest, a lot of stuff singing, and there's, there's a lot of things to find. Um, one of the other big pieces, um, as Julie noted earlier, is that nocturnal species are really um, critically important for us to understand what, what's kind of going on in our state. And, this is often a group of birds uh, about which we know least. And many of these have um, significant 
conservation importance. Uh, night jars, for example, um, are known to be declining and scarce, and there's a lot we can learn. And so this can often also get you uh, in a place to encounter birds. And so the aim for each block is to try and get two hours of atlasing at night. And so in the early season, this might include species like um, owls, great horned owls, really vocal right now, screech owl, barred owl, many species that are widespread throughout the state. And also in kind of April and into May, um, it's a great time of year for American woodcock, especially. And then uh, later into May, Wilson snipe in certain places. And then through the summer, of course, all sorts of rails and night jars. And there's a, a guideline to nocturnal atlasing um, that is on the, um, the homepage of the Atlas right now. And if someone could drop that in chat as well, we've tried to put together kind of a tips and tricks for every nocturnal bird uh, that you might uh, likely encounter if you're out atlasing. And uh, hopefully that'll, that'll provide some fun new pieces. And as you can see, pretty much everywhere in the state, there's an opportunity to go out and maybe submit even the first ever nocturnal um, checklist for, for that block. Um, what we're seeing here in the upper right is uh, blocks uh, and the nocturnal hours for that block. These darker blue green ones are ones that have about two hours or so. Anything that doesn't have a color, anything that's yellow still has a lot of opportunity. Um, then one other piece that, that's really useful is um, thinking about all the different habitats in a block. And so habitats can be difficult to um, define in, in some ways, but what, what helps for me a lot of the time is just thinking about it kind of big, big scale. If you have a block that has some agricultural fields and a forest patch and a pond and a swamp next to that, just making sure that when you're out atlasing that each of those are being covered. And so for the block completion needs, all habitats in a block should be covered. And this can be a way to find many species that might be scarcer. Uh, and again, you might, might not run into that often. So birds like Vesper Sparrow that are often at the edge of agricultural fields and much of the western part of the state, or Virginia Rail, which as far as I can tell is in almost any cattail marsh larger than a swimming pool. Um, but they're just buried in there and trying to find them can be the tricky part. But if you're out there atlasing and spending a bit of time, who knows what you might hear. Um, so this kind of uh, attention to all the different habitats can often turn up some really specialized things that can be a lot of fun. Maybe that beaver swamp down the, the road with the dead trees in it has a red-headed woodpecker in it. You never know. And so there's a, a lot of really specific things that can be um, pretty fun when you're thinking about, I got three miles by three miles here. What's every habitat in there? What can I find? The other piece and one of the, the kind of easiest um, elements of completing a block to, to tackle is um, frankly, just put, putting in the hours, putting in the time and uh, going out there and birding uh, in, in the field as much as you're able within that block to get it above 20 hours uh, of coverage in the context of the, the five years of the Atlas. And so that aim again is three different times a year. So maybe like once in March, April, once in May, June, once in July, August. And that together then gives you a nice range of species throughout the breeding season and also um, if you're putting in at least 20 hours, we'll, we'll pull together a lot of the species that are going to be present there. Um, again, like with all these maps, there's a few areas that jump out in terms of opportunities for coverage. The Adirondacks, um, strap on your hiking boots if you're ready for some adventure and go see what you can find out there. There's lots of hidden bogs that hold all sorts of, of goodies um, or many other places that might not be as, as much of a hiking piece, but closer to home and even everywhere in, in uh, more urban areas like much of Long Island, there's still opportunities um, for blocks that, that don't have 20 hours uh, yet in there. Um, and if you're able to, in, in your, the course of your atlasing, um, think about some of these priority areas. These, again, are just kind of come up again and again as a theme to really be at the, the front of our minds if we're trying to cover, cover our state fully um, in the coming years. Um, one of the, the kind of final, final pieces to think about is just discovering more species. And uh, every, every block has so much to, to offer, whether it's nocturnal, different habitats. And it, I'm always amazed at what you can find in places you think you know. And you go out there and you spend another hour, you walk another mile, whatever it might be. And 
there's all sorts of things waiting to be found. Um, especially in May and June, uh, there's the best time of year to focus on coded species. So coded species are anything that's possible, probable, or confirmed. So basically something that's exhibiting breeding behavior. And the goal for the Atlas has been to get between at least 55 to 95 species. This varies a lot between um, urbanized regions and uh, areas that might have more variety of habitats in some parts of the state. So it's kind of just a way to think about if you're getting to something that's at least kind of yellow on this map here, um, this is again available through the effort map um, on, the, on the Atlas page. That's a, that's a good indication that, um, that there's all sorts, of, all sorts of things still left to find. And the final piece is really going for confirmations. And so um, for each block, for the whole total of species you've observed trying to breed there, whether exhibiting behavior, so possible or higher, um, the goal for the atlas is to get at least half of the species confirmed in that block. So that's doing something like carrying nesting material, carrying food, building a nest, um, or seeing fledged young. And for that, later June and July is the best time of year for confirmations. There's baby birds flopping all over the place. Parents are frantically carrying food, and it's just the best time of year to focus for that. So thinking kind of throughout the year at all the different kind of focuses can be, a, a, again, a fun way to kind of diversify your birding and, and keep, it, uh, keep it entertaining, uh, even if you're, you're covering the same regions just through a different lens. And so again, just kind of zooming back out, there's at least in, in our minds where we're, where we're hoping to put a lot of our time in terms of uh, those of us working on the Atlas, I think, is trying to focus on these elements we've talked about here, um, figuring out how these gaps can begin to be filled in year two um, and see how we can learn from that. And in the remaining three years of the Atlas, continue to, to dive into these and, and other uh, opportunities as they arise there as well. Um, Julie, I'll kick it back to you. Go from there. Great, thank you, Ian. Um, I think that was a really good overview of, of the places that there's just a lot of different ways that people can get involved and you can really use um, your strengths, um, you know, really take advantage of, of your strengths as you're atlasing. So if you, if you like to be out at night, then there's plenty to do. If you like marsh birds, that's great. If you love backpacking, then hit the Adirondacks or, or hit those high elevation habitats. Um, so, so yeah, there's just lots of different ways to be involved, different levels of engagement, and all of it is, is really um, important and valuable for the Atlas. Um, so we are about to head into our breakout rooms.